All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Benny Goodman. I'm trying to make this quick because Kelly got some door. I'm Kel- Corey, I can't even. I can't even concentrate. I'm under the gun so much. Corey got some DoorDash, and I have to go upstairs. It's getting colder and wa- by and, the and, minute. And watch some Harry Potter and, with my 15 year old that I've inherited from my fiance. And Siobhan has like to be like a virtuoso violinist. So like apparently we don't even have time for our own show to be sitting in our sweatpants in our basement. But I'm Benny Goodman, and this is Corey Peza. That's me. Okay, whoa, Ben. People are gonna think that they accidentally hit the 1.5 times speed or two times speed. You know, I'm podcast how you can do that that happens to me all the yeah. time where i'm like wait why are they talking so fast except this is real Should Benny I do it as john is- garabedian you're listening to <laughs> 2020 with siobhan cronin benny goodman and Corey peza now after go. our break it'll we'll hit the ones and twos with uh some halsey and the new one from uh the chain smokers <laughs> stay tuned what's happening right <laughs> yeah anyways this is part two <laughs> with lost symphony guitarist kelly Keraluk. <laughs> Who's a freaking <laughs> monster. And if you have not heard him, check him out in his band. Is it Prism Mind? Prism Mind? Prism, uh, you, well, Prism Mind, I'm pretty sure is what it is. And then so. he, he also plays with Art Griffiths. Se- Griff- I can't even follow it. Sound Chaser. Uh, he, he is his own solo artist, and he's the guitarist extraordinaire to Lost Symphony, which you can find out on lostsymphony.com. But he literally, just so you guys know, we put him against, he's like the guy we put against the computer. He, he, we, we, we made him play against Marty Friedman. Bumblefoot, our dear friend Ollie Herbert, uh, Satchel, like, and he perseveres every time and hasn't quit yet. No, so. he's the actually he's the thread between all of these different uh, players. He truly uh, is. He, he's on he's on almost every single one of the Lost Symphony tracks, and he blends in with all these amazing guests we have. Even on. when we don't want him on it, like he got yeah. on to accept it because he just sent us a solo. There's a song that's on our next record, and we're like, don't play on this, but we sent it out of courtesy because he's in the band, and he's like, and he played on it. Yeah. And he just has no shortage of ideas, so you definitely check this yeah. one out. And if you haven't listened yet, part yeah, one also. It, um, it gets pretty deep into the theory in this one. Uh, so so gets I think we get real nerdy on some compositional ideas. And uh, yeah, so if you're a musician or you like listening to musicians talk about music... <laughs> Well, hold on. But before we alienate everybody's crowd, like uh, uh, that's not a musician. Here's something that's very important. Kelly is very passionate and very good at what he does. And anybody, even if you don't know what you've decided that you're passionate about in life, listen to someone like Kelly and realize what it takes to be as good as someone like him. Because it's so clear and it's so evident because obviously we're all geeks, but like Kelly is the guy that wrote the book. He really did. And the fact that he's so studious, like... Let that rub off on you so you can go, and when you go to bed tonight, you said, I, add, I added value to my life somehow. I think the secret is long hair and Tim Hortons coffee. Exactly. <laughs> like all the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> so check it out. <laughs> Kelly Carroluck. Part two. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of 2020, where we may be socially distant, but we are certainly socially relevant. Join the you sound, horde. You sound out of breath, man. You've been running around. <laughs> I have been running around um, because I had to go get myself some water. He had to go hit he, all of his weed apparatuses before he came you back. You know what? I actually didn't even have time. I called my girlfriend in between takes, and then oh, I was wow, like, oh, look at fuck. you. That was nice. Aww. Yeah, I'm trying. Um, that said, uh, I, I just want to introduce everybody. Uh, we have uh, over there somewhere, um, Siobhan Cronin, the one the one in front of the Yamaha speakers that likes owls. Um, over there, we have Corey Pisa, who is the man, Cheers. the plan, loves drinking, Miller, the champagne of, yep. of beers, Miller High Life. And then from the great land of Canada, and it was just Canada Day. Um, the other day, it was, where it was July 4th for us yesterday, this is going to tell when we do it. Sorry about that. But it just, <laughs> if it's like September, you just know like we're backlogged. Um, yeah. But all the way from Canada, one of the greatest guitar players in our band. <laughs> Give it up for Kelly Caraluck. For those that don't know how to pronounce the name, we have Siobhan Cronin, Corey Peza, Benny Goodman, Kelly Caraluck, yeah, I know. Paul poor, Lorenzo, yeah. and then Brian Goodman. Yeah, our poor, poor interviewers are just so confused. Oh my that gosh. Comes up. I don't even know the name of the guys in the band. Yeah. So I think we need to jump right into it. For those that don't know, Kelly is the guitar player in Lost Symphony, which is our sponsor. 
because if you don't know by now, if you haven't listened to the other 49 episodes that we've done, um, <laughs> we are a band trying to make it in a world where music is hard and now we're doing a podcast and here we are. And <laughs> for those that don't know, the way that Lost Symphony was recorded was pretty much myself and, and Corey a lot and uh, Ollie and my brother, mostly um, in basement studios, begging Siobhan to fly across the country. <laughs> and then all these other guitar players working with us. But a lot of us have not met each other in person or even talked on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to say, Siobhan, before this last podcast, you hadn't even seen Kelly face to face, had you? I know, it's amazing. It's just like the quintessential 21st century project where everyone's just like in their own world and we come together digitally. <clears throat> yeah. Crazy. Yeah, we're yeah. lucky that we're lucky that we're living in this time because That's imagine if true. this uh, this whole pandemic happened, you know, 15, 20 years ago, everyone would just be sitting in their rooms. No, but it's amazing. Even <laughs> and, and on the last episode, Kelly was talking about like you know having to call up the the label for a record that he wasn't able to buy locally, and I just think yeah. like it's so interesting to think of how quickly things have changed. Where you like, and I was saying on a previous podcast, like reading about old composers, you know, that had to order like encyclopedias or like things in you know, in the mail and wait for things to get delivered to learn something. Whereas now you just like type into YouTube, see the greatest guitar players on the planet. You can do whatever you, I mean, it's crazy how quickly things have changed. All at your fingertips. Yeah. yeah. And you'd say, you'd say it used to be easier to, to do scams because people couldn't figure it out, but there's still just as many, unfortunately, <laughs> just like this podcast. <laughs> Go buy our record chapter one, chapter two, yeah. Chapter three, chapter four, maybe. Whatever's if you out guys by the time this podcast us. comes out. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, who knows? 2020-D.com and lostsiphony.com. Uh, but that said, uh, we want to get back into what we were getting into with Kelly. Um, Kelly, the thing that, that I love about Kelly is that, so if you listen to Lost Symphony, one of the things that whether you guys buy this record or not, Okay. Please buy it. Um, we were able <laughs> to it, get so many guitar players that... I know that I grew up inspired by um, that I think are the bar as far as playing, you know, again, like mm -hmm. Marty Friedman, you know, Kelly was telling us on the previous podcast, Rust in Peace was like an aha moment for him. It was certainly an aha moment for me. And so certainly was cacophony. I was in the United States. I could get that. Um, mm -hmm. And to be able to have Kelly play with Marty Friedman, to Kelly, to play with Jeff Loomis, Kelly play with Satchel, with John Dene, and not have it sound like me trying to solo against these guys. It's just so refreshing because a lot of the guitar players that have heard this record, the first thing they say to me is like, I love Kelly. <laughs> I love Kelly. Because the thing is, they all know the, a lot of these other guys, but like you consistently, and and you know, you, you guys can tell me if you agree, but like a lot of the music that we wrote, you wrote themes. It wasn't just yeah. like you soloed, you came yeah. up with these intricate, really melodic, again, lyrical style themes that made these go from surfing with the alien, where it's just like, let's see how many techniques Kelly can play to... Uh, really making them hummable songs that people can remember forever. And it's not necessarily, even though you can play a million notes in three seconds, you choose sometimes to actually have feel. Right. And we touched on this a little <laughs> bit in the last episode, but Kelly, can you kind of talk about your approach to writing and how you come up with not just this assault of notes you do when you need to, but how you kind of approach a holistic song? Well, yeah, especially, well, the thing is that Lost Symphony, the concept of it, being an instrumental album, seeing as the, the players that we are attracting to take part in this, it could very easily just turn into a giant wank fest. Mm -hmm. Like from, it could just be a whole thing of guitar solos with a nifty beat in the background. Right. And I thought, you know what, what a shame. If we have these kind of players and we have it's kind of just the core band even, being yeah. as solid as it is, it would be a shame for it to only be admired or listened to by guitar players. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's my Well, that's what it's like at a lot of these shows. You go to see like Generation X and and and, and it's like a bunch of dudes in the front row like this <laughs> all staring at Tosin's guitar going, "Did he mess up?" And then it's like their girlfriends in the back just going, "Can we go home now?" Yeah, right. My my thing is Did he play I, it? The word I like to use to keep myself aligned when writing is balance. If you like Van Halen balance, 
Because some people might get upset by that. <laughs> it's not a bad album. Because that's not a good, it's not a bad album, but it's not the Van Hager album you want to argue with. No, no, no. It, no, it has nothing to do with that album. <laughs> okay. But Just it's making but sure. Even, even when writing a solo balance, if, if you keep that word in mind, that means that maybe you're going to start off with a, a slow melodic phrase. Well, what are you going to do after that? You're going to balance it. Right. Keep it interesting. Maybe then you'll play a speedier thing, but then you're going to drop down to a bluesy thing. Anything to keep the balance. If all you did was fire out of the gate, right, and just blast the whole time, mm -hmm. it's fighting for about 1.3 seconds. And then after that, you're like numb. But right? isn't that what Dragon Force does for an entire record? Probably, I've never heard a whole album, so well, I, I couldn't make it through a whole album. Well, and I'm, I'm not even saying that they're bad players, but I just my brain can't. We I can only handle seven things at once. Well, I'm curious to ask selfishly because like learning how to solo is something that's totally still out of my realm of vocabulary, but I'm trying to develop it. So I'm curious, like from start to finish, like what is your process of actually like like get into the details about how you actually write a solo? Do you know how because insulting that is. You're you're you're, uh, you're you're so much better than I am, and then you still go on. You're like it's out of my realm. No, it's like, not. I, can't I don't do want that. to say it's totally piano out of my realm. Piano isn't my thing either. And then you play piano better. Than should I just go off myself now? Like no. it's, it's hard enough to play in a band with Kelly and then try to play guitar. But and then it's like, now you're like, I'm better at all these things. That you, but I'm, it's no, not but my you know what? No, but it, it's still a skill, you know, that you have to develop. For me, I'm so used to reading people's music. And like, if I, I can decode whatever's in reading. front of me. He's no, a reader. Reader, but listener. But the point is, if I'm learning something that somebody's already composed, it's, that's a skill that I'm comfortable with. And I can I have the technique, I think, at this point to decode whatever I need to figure out and play. But when it comes to actually writing, like some of the first times I had to do it, I'm like, I can't do this. Like, this is too overwhelming. So it, it's interesting to me to hear like what people think about or do you break it down? Like, what are, what are some ways that you go through at the beginning of the process to come up with a solo? Uh, one of the simplest things you can do uh, but it's probably one of the most effective and I work this is true even when it comes to like writing riffs for a mm -hmm. song or whatever but in the context of Lost Symphony where my primary thing is to either write a theme or play a solo um, instead of thinking notes because that's usually okay what notes can I play right mm -hmm. I think rhythmically first so I think okay if this is the tempo I just think of a rhythm and then put notes to it. Wow. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Rhythmically first, everyone relates to rhythm. Mm -hmm. I mean, music started with some hairy dude smacking a stick against a rock. <laughs> well, I mean, don't forget David Abruzzi said the other day to us on a podcast that Versus was recorded all drums first and he didn't even necessarily know the entire songs yeah. until he recorded because I, and I say this and I'm not a good guitar teacher. But the one, the first thing I say to any student is, if you don't have rhythm, you don't have anything. That's and true. that's so cool that you say that because there's a lot of guitar players that try to play at a million miles an hour, and then it's like you have a guitar player that can play at a million miles an hour, going, "I just focus on the rhythm first. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a novel idea, there, Kelly. And you know what? I, because of that, I never get stumped. If, mm -hmm. like, the, let's say you're writing a song, most guitar players pick up their guitar. They plug it in and they just start noodling. They just, mm -hmm. what are you doing when you're doing that? You're literally just moving your hands where you've moved them before. You're yeah. not, not going to play That's anything. I, I feel that. I, I totally relate to what you're saying there. Yeah. You, you're not going to, you might come up with something 20 minutes later and go, oh yeah, that. But why not cut through all that crap and just go, okay, you need to tether your musicality to something. And I think rhythm is usually the first thing lost like it's usually the, the last sorry the last thing people consider uh, -huh. uh when you're playing guitar anyway, drums obviously it's the first thing but if you just started with that just start you think it would be the first thing but it really but so like always. you're saying with sometimes even, it's hair so you're saying even without the instrument you know just like think like intellectually what's a rhythm that i hear here mm -hmm. wow. when I, uh, the first prison mind album uh, well, that's why guitar players aren't that good is because you're actually asking guitar players to think intellectually <laughs> But I've never, I've never been stumped when writing if I think from a rhythmic approach first. So okay. um, when writing the first Prism Mind album, for example, I never started by picking up the guitar. Mm -hmm. I started by putting up a drum track. You know, mm -hmm. I've got the drums and it's got a series of pre-recorded bits, whether they're fills, grooves, whatever. And I'll just find one that, that I like. And I, I think to myself, okay, my drummer's name is Mike. Mike comes up 
to me. It's Mike Harshaw, who's an un unbelievable drummer who also played in Annihilator, who's incredible. So don't undersell Mike. We love Mike. Mike, you're the best. You're one of the greatest things that ever come out of Canada. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So I, I just think, okay, Mike's just handed me this groove. And he's saying, Kel, what would you come up with here? So I started with drums first, mm -hmm. drum track. And of course, Mike is literally going to do whatever he wants. And I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, this is what you have to do, but it was my starting point. Mm -hmm. I started with that. And then I thought, okay, yeah, I would, I would probably compliment it this way. Instead of me starting first and then going, okay, what's next? What can I do here? That's kind of neat. You know, it, none of those songs started that way. And from, because of that, I don't think that, I don't think any other way when writing stuff for Lost Symphony. Mm -hmm. It's great. Whether it's a solo or whether it's a riff or what or a theme or a chorus or whatever you want to call it, it's almost like how how can I make this catchy? The notes are going to be cool. Like literally, if you have a cool rhythm, it almost doesn't matter what the notes are. That's a good point. Some people are going to be like, that's a strange group, you know, choice of notes, but yeah. yeah but cool. the the other way around is definitely noticeable. If you just have uh straight rhythm or like non-stop yeah. notes or it, it doesn't matter what you play people are it might be cool for a couple bars and then you're like all right like what's next what's gonna happen well that's now? one thing that again when ollie first recorded requiem he had 64 bars in the original version of the song and kelly writes very long composed themes like on negation delirium like you know on a lot of a lot of different songs and negation delirium by the way is on chapter two but if you even on singularity singularity which was one of the first songs we released on chapter one uh chapter one um you listen to that song and i gotta tell you it's one of my favorite chordal things uh, uh chord progressions and ideas that my brother and i have worked on it started off as a piano thing but what brought it to life was when all of a sudden kelly just ig ignored that and then floated on a different level and that's what we were kind of talking about with Jason Lechberg with his keyboards floating over his song. Kelly floats over a whole orchestra and he writes a theme that not only goes along with what everything's doing, but is synergistic in that even though you turn it up in the, like with Conrad, for example, one point Kelly wrote in Leave Well Enough Alone, which is the first song, he wrote a part um, and I sent it back because Conrad's doing this insane shred part and I had turned down Kelly in one of the early bounces and he goes, why didn't you turn up my guitar part? I said, dude, it's so fucking busy. There's so much stuff going on. And he's like, but why don't you hear how it goes with it? <laughs> and if you listen to the actual mix that Corey did, because don't let this guy mix it. I mean, I'm an okay producer. I do all right. I dabble. But it's because Kelly, even though Conrad might be playing 7,914 notes at once, somehow Stevie Wonder style finds the perfect harmony <laughs> and the perfect bass motion and like just how to complement things perfectly. And even with Conrad, who's otherworldly, where I was like, sometimes like you hit, you made that a minor instead of a major, which I almost feel like he did it purposely. Like Kelly always knows my melodic ideas and even can explain them back to me like Siobhan. Siobhan's like, well, you're just doing this. It's just a Phrygian feel. That's fine. And it's really neat, but that's why it is. It's just because you flatted exactly this what you sound like. I know, right? He's like, so, <laughs> but let me, let me ask you this. So you, if you come up with some rhythmic ideas first. Is there some sort of like general, and I don't want to say formula because it makes it sound scientific, but if you're writing a solo, like from start to finish, you have so many bars, so much, you know, amount of time to write a solo is do you know like okay i want to have this much that's kind of rhythmic this much that's more melodic like do you, is there some sort of like underlying breakdown that you kind of adhere to in terms of the structure nothing nothing solid but again i just sort of like i think in terms of that word balance again mm -hmm. right so and i look at it from afar as well so sometimes when, when you get into things you go okay I'm just at this bar and that bar and right and you're, you're, you know, you're looking at it really close, sometimes you lose perspective. So sometimes I just have to like stop, rewind the track, listen to it from the beginning, get to the part that I just came up with and then go, okay, now I see it. Now I see where it should go. But for those who aren't like used to doing that or thinking rhythmically, one of the, honestly, one of the coolest things you can do as an exercise is grab a drum track or a metronome or whatever, a backing track and improvise but sing everything that you're playing and you're not like allowed, jazz style and you're not allowed, yeah, like george benson like richie cotton has done but just as an exercise 
the rule is that you you can't play anything you're not going to sing and mm -hmm. you don't play when you stop to take a breath so basically mm -hmm. you end up with developing a sense of natural phrasing and because you have to tether your singing to your playing it's going to be rhythmic mm -hmm. because you're not going to go all free form you know yeah, you're yeah. more likely to adhere to the beat um, and actually develop like really catchy kind of phrasing. It's a great, it's a great perspective. That's cool. Yeah, no, that's that's so interesting you say that because one of the things that we learn like in in violin technique too is like especially since we don't have frets, you want to learn how to feel like a shift to a high position by singing it. So if you're able to sing it, you're much more likely to hit the note on pitch. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? So it's interesting the connection between vocal music. Yeah. Something very similar to what you were saying that that again, and I've said this on multiple podcasts, and it's, it's something I've used to get. I don't want to say substantially better because I mean, from where I started, substantially better. But in relation to you, you can't say substantially better. Um, but one thing that John Mayer had said um, on, on something that I had watched was play to backing tracks online. So if there's like a like a conga in A, or if there's a salsa in B, play to it and just try. Just go for it. Fuck up for six minutes straight if that's what it takes. And then of course. I think I'm all special. Um, this last week, I'm playing in all these different, I think, modes. I'm like, okay, so this is the yeah. Dorian thing. And and my guitar teacher says to me, you're just playing an Ionian feel with the shapes. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, if you want to play like, you know, I don't know, the Mixol uh, the, the Dor uh, uh, I don't know, Mixolydian, he goes, you play the dominant seventh chord over a uh, scale over this, and that's what gives you that sound. I'm like, but I learned all these shapes that it, you're just moving one note up and playing the same notes in the Ionian. Yeah. And I was just so fucking confused. But that said, I've been practicing to a backing track and now I can play all over the fretboard, but apparently only in the Ionian. So for people that don't know, I still haven't broken out of my box. <laughs> yeah, no, the modes thing is actually universal in, in its frustration level, it seems. And it, it frustrated me for a bit until I realized something. Siobhan tried explaining in Oreos to me and I thought I got it and it's totally not right. There should be goldfish involved. Continue, Kelly. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. The whole modes thing is, it's when, it, when I finally understood it, I realized how unimportant it was. It's like, if you're playing over one chord, it doesn't matter what the shape is. It doesn't matter what, you know, people designate this shape to be Phrygian. Well, guess what? It's only Phrygian if it's played over this chord. Mm -hmm. Odes are moods. They're not shapes. They're not physical patterns. The, the physical pattern that you can visualize makes it easier to learn it, but it's not anything yet, right? Once, right. That, once that chord changes, that mode changes. Mm -hmm. You can't say, I'm playing Fuji mode because I'm playing this pattern. Mm -hmm. Once that chord changes, and there probably will be a chord change, that mode has changed. So wow. you're seeing the fretboard as a connection of... I don't care whether people say five shapes, seven shapes, seven damn shapes, people. Right? <laughs> you got this five shape crap. <laughs> you, but it's all one thing. It's all this. That was the most thing. passionate I've ever seen Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe to cater to some of the guitar players that are listening, because I'm whenever I meet violinists, you know, I always want to ask about like scale routines and like nerdy stuff. But you're obviously someone that's in really good shape as a guitar player. Like I really admire that you're just like on all the time, you know, and I try to like do things every day so that I feel like I'm in good shape as a violinist. So do you have like some things maybe you can recommend or things that you use all the time to, to keep your brain active, to keep your fingers in shape, exercises or Yeah, I, I, I study violin pieces. Great. I, I'm so glad you say that because I tell Brock to do this all the time. He's just like, oh, God, I just can't do that. <laughs> he's too like, busy. No, like he's too busy whittling some form of Americana. <laughs> he's like probably making a, a grandfather chair for the time that you have like grandchildren. And he's like whittling it from one giant piece of oak from the middle of Circleville. <laughs> and you're like, hey, why don't you go and learn that you play, you know, the, the major seven flat five scale over the Locrian? And he's like, but I am literally whittling with my hands something that you, your generations will sit on. No, but I think so about let, like- let's just, let's just put in perspective, <laughs> Shabrock, that you are the crazy musical oracle and that he is good at everything else in the world, including music, but better than me and most people. <laughs> No, but I mean, I always, I would tell him, I'm like, you know what? I feel like music by Bach, where there's inventions in every key, you get used to playing- What's an invention? Scales. 
Well, like the two-part inventions for piano, just like themes. Based, Stop like, with talking like emotions. we know what you're talking about. All right, anyway, I have no idea. It doesn't even matter what it is. The point is Bach wrote a series of lots of pieces, piano pieces where you can read one hand or the other or violin pieces, but you, you learn how to play fluidly in different scales. So I figured for a guitar player, that would be great. You well, know, adapting that to the guitar is that if you consider a typical guitar exercise, it's designed to be played on the guitar mm -hmm. and you'll develop facility pretty easily because it's designed for the guitar. If you take some, and generally a lot of the guitar exercises aren't necessarily musical or inspiring. They're mm -hmm. mechanical and they're designed to build a technique in a certain area. Sure. Well, one of the ones I've been practicing is my, my teacher has me playing different modes with different fingers to create harmonies. So I'm doing one mode on one string with this finger and then one mode on this string or on this finger to create, di to play different scales, I guess, to go up and down. I don't know what he means, but it sounds really cool what I'm doing. Well, there you go. That's the main thing. I mean- th and, and he's giving me all kinds of crazy, ridiculous notes, you know? So I'm like, ah, uh, but he, he'll ask me a question like, you know, hey man, if you are playing in the minor, in the Phrygian, what scale do you, do you, do you play over it? You know what I mean? And, and he'll 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 quiz me, and I never win. I always lose. Okay, so back to Kelly, who has some real <laughs> advice. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, but you're not. Just well, kidding. I'm totally kidding. But you're not. Well, for me, you're not. well, for me, learning violin, um, it's compositionally a lot more interesting. And let's face it, playing something that as I think the word was you had a word for it, Siobhan, earlier today about uh, something that's like designed for a certain instrument. Oh, idiomatic, maybe? Uh, uh, idiomatic. Okay. Something that's like e -o violin. I'm lost. I'm lost. And, you know, for guitar, it's going to be, it's not going to be a smooth ride necessarily. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of the violin pieces I've learned, some of them are, are Bach, uh, a little bit of Paganini. Uh, currently, I'm working on some of the Kreutzer's etudes. Yeah, those are great. And um, we're going to have to climb. Yeah, totally. I love those. <laughs> Real deep. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, they're probably a cinch for violinists now, generally speaking. It's not unusual for a violinist to reach a high level playing these things, right? Like back in the day, it was probably a real challenge. But as mm -hmm. generations go on, people get better. It's like guitar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people just, you know, they get comfortable playing these things over and over again. It's not a big deal. But playing them on guitar is a different animal altogether. Mm -hmm technically really rather difficult to play yeah so the high level playing a violin piece on the guitar is like you're going to get more out of your practice time that's basically mm -hmm. what i'm saying um you i've seen some of the videos of you playing guitar solos on violin mm -hmm. right and it's got to be a similar thing flipped oh right? yeah yeah oh. absolutely there's some things that it's like you hear it and you're like okay this sounds like i can do it but then once you put it on the instrument like i said idiomatic it's just like you know it's my, not built for the violin. do you know my favorite moment of any podcast we've done so far javon what was with you i mean is that I, I when we had i went back and watched the jason costa from all that remains episode and we said can we get a real time um view of you watching jason richardson because we wanted you to transcribe <laughs> it and your face goes from like <laughs> I cannot keep a poker face. I'm immediately reactive to everything. <laughs> and like, like literally, like you look like the, like when they stretch their face in Beetlejuice. Oh, great! Because you're just like because oh. you're just so watching you be enamored. Because here's the thing. Here's the difference. I watch someone like Jason Richardson or Kelly, and I'm defeated. I go. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and you're just sitting there like, okay, this is hard. This is harder. Oh wow, this might be a challenge. This is gonna be a fun challenge. Yeah. This is gonna be a challenge people actually recognize me for. I might actually be proud of myself. Oh my gosh, and no, but my brain the, starts to tick with those things. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I wanna figure oh, I this know. out. You, if people go watch that, go watch that moment, ladies and gentlemen, go back to the 2020 <laughs> episode. Watch my face contortion. And watch your face, no, because you literally, you're absorbing this insane music that I've listened to hose down to give Kelly some reference by Jason Richardson 7,000 times. I don't know what he's playing. I don't even know if it's musical. I don't know what technique it is, what key it's in. I just know that it's literally mind boggling and you're just sitting there like somebody 
has actually asked me a question <laughs> beyond what brand is my cello? Well, and I, I, I really appreciate it more now too, because I've observed in our quarantine time, I've, I've observed Brock practicing a lot and like a lot of the frustrations with picking. He and practices? Like, like, yeah, he practices. He, he works really hard, but you know, he spent a lot of time, like he That's said, as a rhythm guitar player. So he's a really like creative writer, but he struggles a lot sometimes with some of the fast stuff. So I've watched him like, you know, like just sweat over some of these, like going through solos and picking. And I realize a lot of it, like the speed is, it seems a lot harder on guitar than it is on violin. I feel like the bow is like the easiest thing to use sometimes for speed. I, yeah, I can see that because a pick is really a, a tiny bow, but the problem is that there's so much friction that happens. Right. You have to gauge jumping over the strings and yeah, it's a yeah. whole- And everyone plays with a different angle. So sometimes, so here's the thing. It's so like, you know, when Richard Shaw the other day said, well, just play at an angle that's more comfortable. So I changed my angle to like what Marty Friedman did. And all of a sudden I'm sweet picking super fast, but it's so unusual for me that like mm-hmm. I'd have to change my whole feel. But I'm like, if I had just learned to turn my pick from here to here, I would be a thousand times faster because my left hand, like I have practiced playing faster and I can do all the motions, but I go, but if I change it and I just go, I go, but I would never play like that normally. So now I'm just like, I think I'm stuck at like third grade. Well, maybe let's talk about that. So Kelly, what are some things you've done like over the years to develop speed? Because I think that's something a lot of guitar players want to learn. Maybe if you have some tips about that. Well, can you give me the keys to the Lamborghini, Kelly? Uh, is that you, Michael? Um, <laughs> uh, most of it really comes down to it doesn't really matter what angle you have your pick. It doesn't really matter how you hold your hand that much. I mean, because you look at any five, let's take five great players who play fast. Mm-hmm. They're all different. It's all different. But, right. there's, but there's, there's one thing that they all have done and to to honestly to get faster at something you just have to have it so ingrained into your muscle memory that it's you're fast at tying your shoes now because you've done it a million times um you're you're able to write your name quickly now because you've done the work on each individual letter you've learned how to group them together thousands i've seen her autograph it's not that impressive you're not um and you're not forcing yourself to do these motor skill functions, you're not forcing yourself to do them faster. No one tries to tie their shoes faster. No one tries to write yeah. quicker. Yeah. You're quick at it because you've done you've done it carefully and perfectly a million times. So the, the honest answer is, for the most part, and I've heard people say to the contrary that you know you should try to play faster because it's like running. If you're going to run faster, you have to try running faster. That's true for running. <laughs> running, running, is, running isn't a motor skill that 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 involves more muscle and cardiovascular things that do need to be pushed when it comes to fine motor skills like playing an instrument it doesn't work that way right you can try to play faster but all you're doing is attempting mm-hmm. and your muscle memory is recording attempts Yes, I totally agree yeah, with you. Yeah. I tell this to a lot of my violin students. Yeah, it's it's more important to focus on play it as slow as you have to to get it perfect because your brain will encode that. But one know? thing, but okay. So, what do you think about what Richard Saw said? So, I'm gonna say say it to Kelly. So, Richard said that he got a lot faster after he real because he used to practice super slow and he used to say, you know, I get to a certain level and then I would just plateau. And then he said he had to play it super fast, way beyond his ability to actually feel what it felt like to play it fast. And then he'd work backwards. And that once he started realizing that sometimes you have to just go for it was when he actually started playing 30 or 40 BPM faster. Um, I've heard that before. I've heard other players say that. And I think the thing, the careful thing that you have to be cognizant of is that you don't practice that way. You don't practice, which is a totally different frame of mind than playing. If you want to go for it and play faster than you're capable of, do that when you're just noodling. Do that when you're solo and you're goofing around, right? Test yourself. All yeah. right, Dad. <laughs> Send me back to my no, room. It, it makes sense. I think what Richard was no, saying, I like though, that. I, but it, I think it worked for Richard because he also did a lot of the slow practice and yeah. he did kind of get to a level. So it was kind of like the running versus practicing thing. It's like well, he did have to kind of push for the... 
is only so fast. And then when you go to Cradle of Filth, there's a certain level of speed that you need to, where I feel like Andrew Lloyd Webber may have escaped him. Well, and you have to practice stamina too. It's like you can play Bach, like some of this Bach solo stuff, like at a, a comfortable tempo forever. But then when you have to perform it at a certain tempo, you get exhausted. So you have to do, you do have to practice the stamina part of it. But the slow practice is where you really remember the. Do you have like precision. weird muscles in your hand, Siobhan, or like the weird muscle here? Like I have like oh, a probably. weird muscle right there that people are like, what the hell? And you can see like my vein just like pulsating. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, it's just because I play piano and guitar, but like I have these strange muscles I've de I've developed. For me, it's back muscles. Like sometimes if I'm wearing a tank top or something and I like lift my arm, someone's like, oh my God, what do you do to like train your back muscles? I'm like many hours of violin people. <laughs> see, my, my, mine is holding 70s Les Pauls. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you just have to recognize the difference. I think when people, guitar players in particular, read or hear the advice that, no, you have to play above, you have to push, you have to do this. They go, well, then that's all I have to do. Yeah, right. it's, it's a balance, like you mentioned before. Exactly. Well, I was going to say, so I was going to have a, ask you a question about your tone, because the other thing we were talking about was the value of your fingers versus the guitar versus the amp. So for me, if you said you played through an Ibanez into a PV, I would say you're fucking stupid. And when you do it, it sounds unbelievable. <laughs> just like when you hear those people tell the same story, they play through Eddie Van Halen's rig or like Brian May's rig and it just sounded like them. I, I, I've learned that for me, tone is like, I would say a 90% in your hands and then having a capable guitar that you're comfortable with is super important with pickups is a lot of it. And then obviously if you have a certain echelon of amplification that it's really so much more up to you how you manipulate it. Um, but I know a lot of older guitar players are very fastidious and then they have their certain box and it's almost like voodoo and they're like, I put my this in this order and this chain and blah, 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 blah. But in working in a studio, I've seen guys take guitars off my wall that have sounded shitty on 45 recordings and they're like, this, it sounds awesome. Or they come down and they play through an amp that I think sounds great all the time and then it, then it sounds like poo-poos for them. So. Can you tell me how you've gotten your tone a little bit? Because your tone is incredible. And where I'm a tone snob and have all these great instruments, my tone pales in comparison to yours. <laughs> I, to be honest, I'm not a gear guy. So it's like, if I have- a, Gear and tone are not synonymous, by the way. No, I, have a, I have, if I have a decent guitar and a decent amp that I can twiddle around with, I'm gonna get what I need from it. The funny thing is that I remember years ago, I had, um, I sat down one day and I, I I had all these CDs that I'd played on it. I had all these albums. I was just like, kind of listening through it, kind of like a retrospective of, of my recording stuff, mm -hmm. right? Everything from like stuff, like country stuff that I had done, like session work for people. And there's quite a lot of that actually, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to them in, in sequence. And I'm like, I, I'll, I'll listen to something and remember what guitar and amp I had for that mm -hmm. session. And, wow. And and I'm listening and I'm like, there's differences in the production because they were not done by the same people necessarily and they're years apart. But basically, I'm listening to what I'm doing and I'm like, I sound the same on all of them. And I had different gear for all of them. Yeah. I realized, man, that upgrade to the guitar that I had bought for this session didn't really produce much. It's funny, it's funny you say that because I remember seeing Van Halen. Well, Eddie Van Halen and Gary Sharon um, came to the Hard Rock Cafe to do, when they did Van Halen 3. Right. Um, and they had an amp for Eddie and he, I don't remember what it was, but it must've been some solid state something or whatever. And to me, I remember it being unbelievable, but I remember afterwards hearing, as I was waiting to get an autograph or something, hearing Eddie Van Halen yell at the hard rock going, don't you know I have a signature amp? Can't you at least get me something with fucking tubes? <laughs> and I'm like thinking to myself, dude, you just played hot for teacher. Like, like, he didn't play the whole thing, but he played part. And to me, I was just like, oh my God. And then he's sitting there complaining about the amp. And I'm just like, dude, it sounds like Eddie Van Halen. Like you're yelling at this poor guy. But in his defense, uh, 5150, there's a guitar center like right around the corner from this fucking place. <laughs> they should have brought a 5150 amp. And like, heaven forbid, like they put him through like a Marshall Val state. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I don't know what he was going through. Like some <laughs> Fender, like, you know, like with all the built-in effects. I think it had the built-in effects. Okay. I think it was a PV with the built-in effects. Oh. That wasn't his amp. And he was just like, it had like the delay that was built into it. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's such a, an interesting thing. I mean, I'm glad I don't have 
you know, gear acquisition syndrome because it saves me a lot of money. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, instead of constantly looking for the next piece, why don't you constantly look for shaping your own sound with whatever you have, right? Like, yes. Because guitars are pretty. <laughs> well, that's true, right? And, and, the, and the guitar industry thanks you for that. <laughs> Especially right? you, Ben. The gear industry thanks <laughs> For, for always looking for the next piece, right? But I think if you can, def if you think of it in terms of like shaping your own sound with whatever you have, right? You can make one note sound so many different ways just by the way you pick it, by the way mm -hmm. the, the speed of your vibrato, right? You can make one note sound pissed off. You can make it sound lovely, mm -hmm. right? There's one note and you can mm -hmm. do that for a guitar player. That's how you angle the pick, how hard you pick it. Whatever. There's so many ways to manipulate you on that note. Yeah. You get so much from it that. Well, that that explains so much of your playing because one of the things that I I, I tell another story where you know uh, guitar you know you know in guitar world they used to ask all the guitar players like one question, and they'd ask uh, you know one of them this this one time was uh, what's your favorite guitar solo. And all these guitar players went through it. And Trey Anastasio says, uh, from Fish, says, My, I have a favorite note. It's Jimi Hendrix live at the Fillmore 1970. He holds out one note and he says, he says more in this note to me than Yngwie Malmsteen's entire first record. <laughs> and I remember thinking about that because I love Yngwie and I loved what that first record did. But uh, there's really has become a dichotomy for me between like the ferociousness and technicality of your playing and how much feel you have. And you as well as the reason why I love Marty Friedman and it totally explains why Marty changed your world, um, are a great balance between the sheer uh, violympics that is Siobhan and then also knowing to play with feel. Because I feel like that's the biggest thing that all these technique hunters, chasers, uh, that do 40 second videos of insane things forget is that you should feel something when you're playing it and you should emote something so that the listener also feels something because a lot of these players play and I feel nothing other than I should just stop trying. Well, and that, yeah. you know, your tone can really come from everything in the fingers and whatever. And what I was going to say, what I love about violin and particularly just playing an acoustic instrument is like, I was going to tout this book, which is so cool that you have a book that's like all about how to produce the exact tone can, that you want. Can you want. tell people what it is? Uh, so the, so it's, it's called Tone by Simon Fisher for any violin nerds that are out there. But this is what's so cool is it, it breaks down like tone really comes from like, yeah, the shape of your finger, what contact point you're using with the bow. And that's like taking amplified music completely out of it. And if you can learn how to play with good, like underlying tone that comes from your body, it's like totally different. Oh, Game sure. Changer. And then you we, can we talk about vibrato? Like, sure, it's probably I mean, I, different I think, between violin and guitar. Well, but I think that well, I, I think I think there's plays with like a violin vibrato. It's weird. I use vibrato. I use a I, I think it's called circular vibrato, which I think is a, a vi thing that I actually got from my my guitar teacher uh, Adam Calris, who's a friend of, of uh, ben insane and I. guitar player. Yeah, um, he was the one in backstage but, past but chasing, it, was lamenting over. Prior prior to me learning that, uh, I think I had the uh, the a lot of guitarists get this from watching people like Zach Wilde and, and, and even Dimebag sometimes who are masters of vibrato, but the way it looks and the way it sounds can be a little different. So you get people to just go, ah, ah, I gotta get this note to go. <laughs> and it's, it's become my biggest pet peeve, especially like recording. You know, you get a guitarist <laughs> that comes in and, and they hit this note and then it just becomes this chaotic thing. I'm like, what are you trying- I can't do that by the way. What I are you trying it. to do? Um, so exactly I, what you're saying. I, I always try to think of vibrato as a vocal vibrato. Um, you know, when you hear a singer and how naturally it just kind of starts to evolve. And you know what it is? The difference is rhythm. Exactly. Not just wiggling your fingers. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's like you have to control the frequency. That's why, it's, speaking of Ingve, you make fun of him all you want. When that guy stops, no, he's got he great finally he's does great. hold the note. It's like no one... Unbelievable. Uh, right and he gets no credit for that until well no here's the problem here's the problem he gets credit for it the problem is is that Ingve in 1985 is different than Ingve now because Ingve now plays so many notes over like his songs are sometimes almost unrecognizable other than he'll hit like one or two parts of a melody and like let's say I'm looking at a, a set list right now 
uh, Far Beyond the Sun. You know the song so well. I know the song so well. But seven minutes of that song is unrecognizable because he's just going through crazy arpeggios. I just bought so, a, a chart for this and I looked at it and I'm like, it's like partial tabs and like treble clef music. And I'm like, learn I that song. It's great. I mean, part of it, that, yeah, it's like, I don't even know if it's worth reading the music. I should just slow it down and listen to it because it's like, the, the, it's madness. The, the point is, is that that song is so deliberate, but when he plays it live now, he does so much extra fat that it takes away from the fast notes that he's doing. So where I agree with you that on album he, and even live when he holds out the notes, he's able to emote. The problem is, is that he doesn't hold back. He has no restraint anymore. And I mean, obviously, in, when you think Ingve, you don't think restraint. Right. But even when it's you hear his, far beyond, kind of his thing. It'd be but weird if you if hear he, far beyond the planet. sun, though, for example, <laughs> um, there is restraint in that song. Um, and then when he lets loose, it lets loose. And the fact that there's dynamics is what makes his crazy parts crazy. And what he does is he just makes every part as crazy as the crazy parts. And that, for me, takes away a lot of those it's melodic notes. Awesome. Now balance there it is again there's no balance yeah. can, I, can i just pop in here and say that i actually my friend had actually just recently sent me a picture of ingve because he lives in miami oh. and he lives <laughs> he lives in my friend's neighborhood and that's him like just casually riding in his you know, red he ferrari drives, he drives like four ferraris around all the time in fact he's like I, so gonna, extra, I'm, so gonna extra. I'm gonna tell you two super fast ingve stories just because i have to i have to i don't mean to interrupt kelly but i have to so one so we had jason from diecast and he tell uh, not him, but um, Paul was in the band and John told me the story at the time that they were recording in the same studio as Ingve Mountainstein and Ingve would have to take, it was like a, down a long path and Ingve would take his Ferrari and it would be covered in dust every single day. And he would come into their session and ask really stupid trivial questions like, how do you cut and paste something? And like would interrupt their session. And it was just really obnoxious apparently. And then on the last day, they went outside and I apparently drew giant dicks all over his car, his like 87, 86 Ferrari Testarossa or whatever, um, all over his car because he was just like that much of a jackass. Story one. Story two is when I first talked to Derek Sherinian, who, who played keyboards with him a few times and had him on his record. He told me he's the only human being that in the middle of a session will change Rolexes three times. That he like literally would notice, and of course this is something Derek Sherinian would notice, um, that he would be in the middle of a session and that he'd go to the bathroom and then all of a sudden he'd come back wearing a completely different like $40,000 Rolex. Story two. Well, that's a big story part of tone as well. The Rolex. And then story three, is when I got his autograph and got this pic because I actually hunted Ingve down um, because we went to Generation X, me and my friend Alicia, and I was like, I'm getting Ingve Malmsteen's autograph. I know he's not nice, but I'm getting a picture of him. I, I need to, I need to meet Shameless. him. Shameless. <laughs> and so, so, so Zach Wilde's walking around with a fucking, uh, you know, Viking hat with like fur on it going, like, Hey guys, how are you? I had a great night. And he was super nice. Nuno's with his 75,000 people from, from Portugal. Um, his whole family's there. Like there's like 8 million betting courts and they're all eating pizza and drinking beer and they're great people. They're fun. Oh my God. And then Steve Vai's walking around being affable. He actually sat there and explained to me it was the first night, um, Medford, Massachusetts, 23rd of November, 2018, is the first night they played Bohemian Rhapsody. And then Steve Vai sat there and said, well, most people in this band don't read. So I actually charted it out this way. And then I did, and he explained how he did it. Ingve, and now you have to understand, Generation X is an example of how the music industry is dying in some ways because these guys should all be touring giant venues themselves. But instead they played the Chevalier Theater in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, so Ingve is now in a broom closet. That's his dressing room. It's literally like a high school. It was an old high school and a movie theater, but it was like a, a broom closet. And he has this big like gopher guy with like glasses who's been with him forever. And he's in the closet and he's like, make sure nobody's there. So the guy like looks out. Steve Eyes walking around. Zach Wilde's walking around. Nuno and all the friends people are walking around. Ingve in literally a three by three broom closet sitting there, we have no idea what he's doing. Alicia and I are waiting outside because I'm like, I'm gonna get his autograph. There's no way he can pass me without stopping. No way at all. He has this guy come out, gets him a sub. The guy leaves the sub by the door. You see someone like just take like the hand and like just pull the sub back in and eat it. I'm like, bitch has gotta go come out sometime. So he comes out and I'm right there I'm like, Ingve! And then he just goes this to me, he goes, can I get an autograph? Can I get a picture? <laughs> it's 
<laughs> so walks back so inside, like, literally, <laughs> like walks back in, like backwards into this three by three, like, waits, kind of like looks out again to see if I'm gone. And then he like, realizes he can't do this. He's like, he's like, oh, well, you need a marker. And like, meanwhile, I'm like, oh, you should take the picture. I put my arm around him, like, and then I'm like, here's a marker. So if you see Ingbe's autograph that he has in mind, it's just like literally like a scrawl. And then like, he's like not even looking at me. He's walking out. As he's walking out of the venue, he takes his Ferrari luggage. He's wearing his pea coat. He's like all, got his like scarf on. His Ingbe hair is flowing. There's a whole bunch of people with their Rising Force records going, Ingbe! Ingbe! <laughs> There's the bus. No one looks at him. He doesn't look at anybody. He looks at nobody. They're all yelling at him. He just walks straight ahead, leaves his luggage, Walks into the bus, there's like fucking Star Wars like smoke coming out of the bus, and his like gopher goes around, takes his suitcase, and then he's just gone. Oh. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but that's Ingve Mounds. So back to Vibrat and no, I was gonna <laughs> ah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You, you uh, held up a book there earlier, and it reminded me of a book that I got recently that I think you might be interested in. Check this out. Oh wow. Violin. Oh, okay. Chrysler. So, so for our listeners, it's a yeah. violin mastery. Violin yeah. Mastery is used with, with like world class violinists. That's amazing. I'm surprised I haven't heard of this book before, but I have to order it. Really old, but they basically talk about what they did to get to the level that they're at individually. Yeah. So, that stuff is gold. I feel like whenever you can, you can just get one trick or one piece of advice from somebody, and it totally makes a breakthrough for you. Totally. I, yeah, those things are amazing. So they talk about practice, they talk about tone, they talk about everything. Yeah. Uh, I'm just scratching the surface on it. As you can see, it barely started it. But, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That is, I think things like that are so easily transferable to any instrument, because at the end of the day, it's all music. Oh my gosh, there you go. There. Can you Ben's see, holding can you up see, a picture. Can you, can you see the picture? Oh, we should probably put it on there, but like, it's, right. Ingve looks so displeased. <laughs> he like literally could not look any angrier. He's just like, <laughs> oh man. But the, actually, he has kind of a half smile on, kind of like, you're good, kid. You're good. You did this. You really, you really, you re and he's wearing, he's wearing a really long black scarf. I've actually, I've, I figured this out that the more famous you are in the music industry, and if you really like want to peacock and let people know how important you are, you wear a longer scarf. So like, I, I, Ingbe's scarf's really long, but I tell a story how Kenny Arnoff showed up backstage, and like there was Dave Mustaine was here, and like Johnny Lang's over there, and Ernie Bach, who's a billionaire, is over there. They're all wearing scarves, and then like. Kenny Arnoff's like five six, and his scarf is like this red scarf wrapped like sixteen times, and it's still down to the ground. <laughs> so just hey, but pay attention to that next time you see any of these guys out. Are they wearing scarves? If they're not, they're probably not a big deal, right? They're not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Marie Cronin will agree with me. Oh yeah, she's all about scarves. Any sort of decoration that you can put on yourself. If it's not rings, Burberry or better, rings. don't even bother. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that Anne Marie Croat? Well, if it's not Burberry she, or better, don't bother. She's big into fashion. She had a store for many years, so yeah, she's she's big into labels. But <laughs> so Kelly, when are you writing your book? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, I don't know about a book, but uh, I am working on some transcriptions for this stuff that we're doing. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, we got to be a book by itself. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I, th I think that it's fascinating to hear your approach to composition, especially your perspective as far as the rhythm coming first. Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think that something we're definitely going to have to do with Lost Symphony is is delve deeper into your mindset on composition and, and your theory, because I, I, I find it fascinating, and I'm sure any, any of the listeners that are into guitar and composition will definitely find it fascinating as well. Yeah, by all means. Yeah, um, no, I mean, it's super fun for us to talk about stuff like this, because even when we're, you know, I'm preparing to like talk to guests I don't know yet, you know, I look up interviews and the type of stuff that like maybe a radio person or a promotions person will ask. Hey, Kelly, so, we, we, got, we got Kelly up in Canada. There. Yeah, yeah. So different from the stuff that I actually want to hear. And I feel like, yeah, if you can find books or you can find podcasts or videos where people really talk about like behind the scenes process, that's what's so interesting to me, you know, is understanding how other people hear music. And well, maybe you guys need music. to do an exercise together. I'm gonna challenge you both, just like I've challenged you every single time. Maybe <laughs> you guys need to do a JS Bach piece and you I'm, need to do a guitar anything. piece. Hold on, this is my proposition. He teaches you a super hard guitar solo that you guys, like a Racer X something or whatever, that you guys can harmonize together on violin. And you teach him, or you work together, you don't need to teach him, but work together on something violin that's out of his realm together. And you guys can now have a super guitar thing that's Kelly's 
domain, yeah. and then of island, since you guys both like the moonlight in the other's yes. world. Let's the do it. The gauntlet That's has the dream. been thrown. I'm just telling you, Perfect. I'm waiting for this because I hope on 2020-d.com you can download these things. I'm inventing bands that don't exist and projects <laughs> that haven't happened yet. I you love heard that. it here first. Anything right. to break out of my my zone is perfect for me, so I'm I'm totally down. The most uh, the quickest one I could pull together right now would be Kutsu's A2 number two. Okay, yeah, of course, I know well, that then one. That's the one we should do. Hell sure, yeah. I mean, maybe, you week. know, whatever you'd like to do. It doesn't matter if it takes a little while. Whatever, yeah. if you have an idea of something you want to do, then I think he just told up. you. Yeah, well, Very of course. <laughs> So meeting's an option. <laughs> so I guess you know we're we got we got about about ten minutes left here. Uh, Kelly, why don't you talk a little bit about your other projects? Because you you know you've had a long career and and you have other other bands that you really good with. bands we yeah, haven't even great. talked about yet. Yeah. Um, well, my my bands, Prism Mind, uh, we're kind of more of a progressive rock metal king. Somewhere in somewhere in the realm of Megadeth meets Dream Theater kind of stuff. If you wanted a reference point. Um, Vocal wise, uh, a lot of times people say that John sounds kind of Dio ish, and sometimes he sounds more uh, like classic, classic rock kind of style. So, not, not grunty vocals or anything like that. Anyway, we're working on album number two. Uh, the writing is almost done. Have you explained he also plays bass and that, like, you guys are like a power, isn't it like a power trio thing going on? Yeah, three of the four of us play and like do a cover band kind of thing. Yeah, okay. So I was going to say yeah. you play, so he play. I can't even keep up. So just so you guys know, you have art Griffin sound changer, uh, ch sound chaser. You have yep. prism mind. You have what's with Jack Sith yep. there. And, and Kelly's on so many things. And the thing is, is that everyone wants, he's like the Paul Lorenzo of Canada because <laughs> Paul's in a hundred million bands because he's so good at what he does that everyone wants to be in a band with him. So he's in like 16 bands simultaneously. I can't even follow. And, and, and then he plays in permutations of each band with other bandmates. So it's like, how am I even supposed to be your fan if I don't even know which one is which? <laughs> well, it, it goes on from there. I also play with, uh, do, do you know the progressive rock band Saga? Yes. Uh, the, the original drummer of Saga, Steve Negus, uh, I play in his solo band. We're working. You act like I don't stalk your page and watch every single thing and comment. <laughs> we and know you do. I've friended every one of these people because I'm fans of them. And like Steve and Art, um, all these people, I, I we've had interactions online because we have mutual respect. Because And this is what I love about Kelly. Kelly gives all of us, well, Siobhan doesn't need it, but like me... Corey a little bit, but me especially a higher level of respect from higher ups in the music industry because you know people like Art and Steve like for those that don't know are musical savants. They're incredibly talented. So for them to say like, hey, I really like your song, or this is really great, or good job, Kelly, but also Benny, this is very well composed. I always think to myself, they got twenty twenty. <laughs> So yeah, there's a whole bunch of different projects. There's another one I'm working on now. Uh, a friend of mine who I used to teach with, actually, uh, Ken Baird, he's got a project called Monarch Trail. And it's very much progressive rock, kind of Genesis, kind of Marillion. Like the lamb lies down over Broadway, like Peter Gabriel Genesis, or like Phil Collins, I Can't Dance Genesis? No, like earlier kind of stuff, for sure. Okay, let's just well, make sure we're on the same page. Because yeah. that's a different band in my mind. <laughs> True, I got Peter, Peter Gabriel versus Phil Collins only. And not they're both great, but it's like you know some almost more than the differentiation between Van Halen and Van Hagar for some people. Sure, yeah, I can see that. Because one's a pop band and one's like a progressive rock band bordering on ELP. Right. Very much so. Yeah. So that kind of stuff uh, working on as well. So there's a lot. That's great. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put links to all those projects yeah, in, the, awesome. uh, in the description as well. And everyone, literally, go watch Kelly. Go to YouTube. Go check it out. And watch all the Lost Symphony stuff on LostSymphony.com. We have yes. a lot of really cool stuff. For me, especially, it was really cool to be able to watch the playthroughs that we forced Kelly to do because <laughs> I never actually saw someone play Catnip High, for example, which to me yeah, is... Yeah, that's a good If you listen to it as a guitar player... Chapter 1. On chapter chapter one, 1. As a lot of people don't realize... Um, it almost seems like it's not real. So when you play it on the screen, it's kind of like 
this can be done. Yeah. Like, this is actually happening. So like that's it makes it so much more interesting to me because it's like, yes, we know people can punch notes in Pro Tools, but can you really do that? And you really can do this. And that's a really huge part of, of Lost Symphony. And we're very proud of that. And, you know, in, in a world of a lot, there's a song called In, in a, a world, world too. But in a world where there's a lot of guitar players that <clears throat> we're the training wheels. And I'm not saying anyone in particular, uh, and where the the standard is perfection, we really tried to have feel on this. And what you're talking about with your vibrato and and your rhythm and your thinking, like we never edited any of Kelly's parts other than if we move something, where, but none of it's edited, not his timing. We may have timed like one note that he called us later and said, I don't like how I feel about that. <laughs> but on an entire record with maybe 20 million notes, um, <laughs> this is all natural and there's no gluten in it. And it's because <laughs> Kelly actually practices slowly and thinks that if you play fast, yes. it's not practicing, it's noodling. So that I'll, I'll remember that when I say I'm practicing 14 hours a week and it's only 13 minutes. <laughs> well, the, the process of doing those little promo videos is really kind of interesting because I mean, there's a million playthrough videos out there, but it's different in this case because a lot of these things were recorded years ago. Like, yeah, like, right. I'm and relearning so, things myself. It's like, what the fuck listen, did I play? I have to relearn it. <laughs> Well, like the video is done while recording because that's just chaos. Like for me to manage a camera and try to record it. Yeah, and try to that is really hard. Yes. Yep. So I have to relearn it and then practice it. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> is that what that was? I thought it was Brock. <laughs> no. He went, my dog was perched on his little throne on the other side because he was scratching at the door. So I was like, okay, come sit. Now he wants to get out. So anyway, sorry about that. Animals. <laughs> But yeah, going through that process of like recreating it is actually really cool. It's takes a long time. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of practice. But at the end of the day, it's like, I've relearned it. I've regained it. So now when we finally go out and play, I have a fighting chance of actually remembering how to play this stuff. There we go. <laughs> yeah, when we go on tour, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope this podcast is, is is successful because it's probably our only chance. <laughs> I don't, you know, we, Dave, David, uh, I don't, oh no, it was Jason Lechberg was saying um, he doesn't believe in luck, much like Han Solo. But I, so that's why we're doing this podcast for everyone to know, for everyone to know, we want to sell music. Kelly, <laughs> Siobhan are studious musicians, but I'm the jerk that goes, but hey man, let's find the low hanging fruit. And you guys listening, there we go. You're the low hanging fruit. <laughs> Thank you for joining the horde. We appreciate yeah. you. You could be anywhere else, but you're listening here with us. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And Kelly, thank you for for yes, spending thank time you so with much, us. Kelly. It's it's been so been cool awesome. to talk to you. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll certainly we'll certainly have to have you back because uh, there's so much so stuff much. to talk about yeah. still. Yeah, never really? enough time. Scratching the surface. Cool. Ben, you want to take <laughs> it home? And we're, and we're really we're really honored. Um, first off, to have Kelly on as our official ambassador, because if you guys, if you look inside, Kelly is the only official guitar player in this band. So everyone else is a guest. And I argue all day long that we don't need the guests to enhance what we've done. But thankfully we have the guy that we go, well, if you're gonna put Marty Friedman on the track, because I remember specifically the first time, and this is the last thing I'll say about Kelly. So Marty Friedman is a very fastidious individual who doesn't play. He specifically says, I don't want anyone harmonizing with me. And he's even particular about who plays on a track with him a lot. And, and rightfully so, because you don't, you don't necessarily want to hear him playing with someone that sucks. He, he's particular, and I respect him for that. Um, I told him I wanted you to play on a song, and he like completely had written you out because he had no idea who you were. So I sent him catnip high. I said, Marty, I know that you trust me on most things. This is the guy. Can you just believe me on this one? Mm -hmm. And you told me when you worked with him, he was like very affable and very agreeable, but like, you don't understand. Jeff Loomis, when I first talked to him, was like, I don't even know if he likes me. He'll probably be like, why did you say that? No, like, but, like, but Marty doesn't let you know necessarily. Like, it takes a long time for him to let down his guard enough to even say, yeah, man, like, like here's a part of a song because he's so... Dude, he did Dragon Kiss. He did Perpetual Burn. This guy has it all out like freaking Nostradamus in his head. So for him to just take you open arms into a song tells me that my ear was good to know you're the best. And I'm awesome. you, sir. Really funny. 
when he gave me the assignment for yes, I think I, it, the world is over. I think it was that the homework. Track? Um, yeah, he gave me homework. He's like, okay, I, here's what track I, one on chapter two. By the way, track one, chapter two, Jeff Loomis, Marty Friedman, and Kelly, as well as Siobhan throws down <laughs> a little bit in there. But it was it was really kind of funny because he's like, okay, here's Jeff's part. I want you to redo Jeff's part this kind at this time because I think he just kind of kind of tasted this part. So I want you to do a, a variation of his part here, and then I'm going to do it here, and then you do a solo here. So he's giving me all this information. And I go, okay, I've heard of the rumors of Marty. Let's, <laughs> I'll do my best. But, and he gave me a deadline. He's like, I want the track by the 4th because I'm recording on the 5th and I live in Japan. So really it's... Oh my, know. yeah. So I'm like, okay. Time to, <laughs> you know, bear down here. No pressure. Get it done. Record it. I send him the file. I hit. I hesitated to hit send. I'm like... <laughs> Rightfully so find it so i hit the button and now i'm just waiting for like a wave of like this isn't good enough for blah, blah 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 and all he and the next day he wrote back and he just said wow that's really cool man and <laughs> did I'm you like, frame that email and put it on the wall i did <laughs> I'm going to, anyway. and just so everyone knows for that specific part just and i'm and i'm gonna leave this so you guys understand the world is over which is track one on chapter one and you guys can tell me if you agree in my mind is an homage to cacophony and what i wanted to do by putting marty friedman and jeff loomis together obviously jason becker you know love him he is an inspiration can't play who's who's i don't want to say the closest thing but who's a guy who's technically proficient enough that has enough soul and feel to do that Definitely. jeff loomis and then in my mind kelly so what marty wanted out was what Jeff had actually already videoed for us. And we're like, what the fuck? Why would you take that out? But what he, what you did is you actually flipped it around. So where you solo and, and there's a, 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 an, a, an arpeggio that's sweet picked, Jeff does the inverse of that. So we actually, when Corey and I were trying to figure out how the fuck are we going to put this thing together, Corey was just like, well, it's an arpeggio. It's a broken chord. It should just technically work. Let's just see. And he put them down both ears. And if you listen to the end of the, so the song, one of you is soloing while the other one's doing a sweet pick arpeggio. And the other one does a sweet pick arpeggio as the other is soloing. And you hold up against Jeff Loomis <laughs> so well. And it's so interesting and it's so cool. And then the rest of the song, we have Marty and Jeff duking it out. And there's so much that really I feel like, and I'm very proud to say this, that this is the closest thing for me as an homage to what Cacophony was in the 80s. That right. was like Speed Metal Symphony. And you're the only guitar player that I know that's not of the Marty Friedman, like Jeff Loomis, like Valhalla level, you know, already. <laughs> yes. Already acknowledged <laughs> by the rest of the world that can hang with these dudes. Because if yeah. you said, because Marty asked me to play on stage in Boston, and I said, no way. <laughs> and it goes from that song, just so you guys know, from that song into Leave Well Enough Alone. So if there's no pressure as far as Jeff Loomis and Marty Friedman duking it out, the homage continues through Leave Well Enough Alone with Conrad and Kelly. And yeah. that song is so cool because they both play through almost the whole song. I mean, you guys have your own solo parts, but it's much like Cacophony in that it's not that it's player A, then player B, then player A, then player C. It's literally you guys play and trade off and then play and harmonize, and it's so cohesive and fluid. And to go from a song like The World Is Over, it's like, where do you go from there? Leave Well Enough Alone is our <laughs> spinal tap. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And on that, you've been 2020. We love All you. All right. Thanks, Thanks Kelly. Kelly. Thank you guys.